Hello and welcome to SFF 180 and the seventh installment of the 12 Days of Halloween 2017. Tonight, the Italian city of Turin experiences a phenomenon of collective psychosis in the 20 Days of Turin. Thank you once again for joining me. Thomas here, your host, as always. Now, it's always exciting for me every year at Halloween to rummage through the past year's offerings in horror and weird fiction. But it's a pretty rare privilege to encounter a work of horror in translation, especially of an obscure work that's only just now coming back into the spotlight after many decades. The 20 Days of Turin is just such a book, originally published in Italy in 1977 and written by Giorgio De Maria, a prominent playwright, critic, and musician who died in 2009 and who, during his lifetime, invented his own musical genre and hung out with guys like Umberto Eco and Italo Calvino. The 20 Days is the best known of De Maria's four novels, and it's finally available in a fluid English translation by Ramon Glazov. Now, in the world of speculative fiction, we enjoy picking out old books and being able to point to themes and plots that were prescient, where the writers seem to have somehow read the tea leaves and anticipated the future of the real world with uncanny foresight. The thing is, many times, in science fiction especially, we're not able to do that as much as we'd like. For all that science fiction tries to look forward, it's hilarious how cloudy its crystal ball has been over the years. Even the cyberpunks, who were considered inconceivably cutting edge in the 80s, ended up getting so much wrong and failing to anticipate so much else that a lot of the work from that movement feels badly dated, even when it's still really entertaining. And so it's worth mentioning just how much of a stir the 20 Days of Turin has caused among readers in 2017, with how close Demaria managed to come in getting things right. The story is a bizarre, nightmarish allegory that not only addresses terrorism, which was such a huge crisis in Turin throughout the 1970s that the entire period is called the Days of Lead, but somehow manages to anticipate social media, and not just social media, but the psychological damage that social media can and does inflict upon individuals whose isolation from the real world has gotten so extreme, it's become straight up pathological. I mean, you ever notice how when some nutbag goes on a shooting rampage, people suddenly notice how many hints the guy had been dropping on his Facebook page? The story is told, interestingly enough, in a manner similar to Lovecraft. There is a narrator, whose name we aren't told here, who lives many years after the horrific events in question occurred. Now, for reasons of his own, he is compelled to investigate and learn as much as he can about these events, and the Odyssey quickly spirals into his own descent into terror. Damaria's narrator wants to write a book about the 20 days of Turin, an inexplicable event from years before in which hundreds of people took to the city streets late at night, not quite sleepwalking, just, you know, wandering around in a kind of zoned-out fugue state. Now, a great many of these people, in turn, were set upon in their nocturnal rambles by some kind of killer, described as being like a very tall man dressed in gray. I mean, whoever the killer was, they were strong enough to snatch up people bodily and crush them to death, the same way you might throw a beer bottle against a brick wall. Linked to these murders is a place called the Library, founded by a group described only as a bunch of very young go-getters, you know, super polite and upbeat. In other words, they sound just like any hyped young entrepreneurs pitching a hot startup. Now, who they are precisely, or where they came from, is never learned. Now, their library refuses to stock actual published books. Instead, they get people to submit their diaries, journals, personal writings, whatever they may be. Now, these journals can remain anonymous, but readers are given contact information for any writer for a small fee, if they wish to open up a personal dialogue. The library grows quickly, and many of its submissions are as sick and disturbing as anything you might find in some of the internet's worst sewers. The library draws in people who, as Demaria puts it, have no desire at all for regular human connection but who are also keen to know if there may be anyone else out there in the world who can relate to their dark obsessions. After the library is shut down and most of its contents destroyed, 
It's too late to return the genie to its bottle. The journals are now being distributed on their own, left on sidewalks and in trash cans. You know, anywhere anyone can pick them up and then forward them on. As the book's narrator pushes his investigation forward, he finds everyone unwilling to talk. His barber, a random woman at the market. He's even accosted on the street at one point by a nun who warns him about the risks of dredging up the past. It can't possibly help the dead and can only bring more harm to the living. Just let it go. Don't push your luck. The narrator's own life grows increasingly surreal, until even his favorite hobby of playing the recorder no longer suffices for self-care. He thinks he can't recognize the city anymore. Statues seem to have relocated themselves to different neighborhoods. He sees sharp young men wearing ties like the librarians who seem to be watching his every move and speaking into walkie-talkies. A red car looks like it's following him. Uh, some random stranger, a major weirdo, begins sending him deeply fucked up letters seeking friendship. I won't tell you how it wraps up, though I will say the book's mind-blowing ending is justifiably famous. An impressive example of how to deliver on a horror story's premise while leaving some mysteries still open-ended. The Twenty Days of Turin is short enough to be a Tor.com novella, and it has the intoxicating quality of a bad dream. It is thankfully not only short, but a very easy read, which can't always be said about older books or translated books. But despite the prose feeling a bit formal in the first couple of chapters, the translation flows smoothly, and the Unrelenting weirdness is even livened up by a few moments of carefully placed humor. I can't say I've read many books quite like this one, although the easiest way to recommend it would be to push it towards the China Mieville crowd. Though times and technology have changed, it's frightening to realize that human anxiety and paranoia seem to be universal constants, and that it's precisely the banality of evil that makes it so incredibly dangerous. And that's it. All I have time for, for this episode of SFF 180. I want to thank you all once again for joining me. Remember, the most important part, these are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please slam that like button, share the video far and wide with all your friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you haven't done so, that is how SFF 180 grows as a channel. You can also support the channel at my TeePublic store and at my Patreon, where recruits into Wink's Army for two bucks a month get little perks like getting to see the videos early and things like that. So I want to thank all of those amazing people for their support. I want to thank all of you for being amazing viewers. And I guess I will see you all once again tomorrow night at midnight for the next installment of the 12 Days of Halloween.